Hello, this is Chala Dinkoy, CEO and founder of The Repositioning Expert. I am here with another edition of my podcast, The Naked Marketing Podcast, where we're both clearly closed, but we get <laughs> naked about our mistakes, about our marketing mistakes. Welcome, Nicholas Mitsakos. Tell us all about who you are and who you help. Well, thank you. Um, it's very nice to join you. And so I've been uh, doing this uh, for quite a while. So I've been an entrepreneur and uh, an investor, really a venture capitalist for over 30 years. And uh, most of that has been focused in Silicon Valley, although I also have done work in Europe and, and in Asia. And you know, one of the things that um, I really enjoy is getting involved with you know, teams early on. And if I can kind of digress for just one second, I think one of the things when we talk about starting a venture or even staffing and building a venture, that you know, the team and the people you work with are the most important factor. I know there's a lot of a lot of discussion about, well, find your why, find your purpose, right? And then figure out what to do and how to do it. Unless you have the right people, none of that matters. And now I know there's overlap between having the right people and sharing values and sharing a, a sense of purpose, a sense of common, common drive. Yes, all of that really matters, but you really have to start with the right people. And you know, one of the real benefits to what we do is if you're with the right people, and how do you define right people? Well, you know, there's chemistry, there's all sorts of things, but most importantly, it's what do you do when things go wrong? Mm -hmm. right? And, and you know, Shala, one of the things that uh, I, I always hear about when, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I've been pitched thousands of businesses, right? And I've been involved with at least over 50 startups in a pretty involved way. And one of the things that, a fundamental mistake, is people talk about, well, here's what happens when everything goes right. Right. Here's what's great about this opportunity, you know, flying cars, right? You know, here, here's what goes. This is going to be wonderful, right? And, and I find that almost meaningless, right? Because, yeah, if things, go, if things go well, this is going to work out, you know, duh, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens when things don't go well? And, you know, so tell me the challenges you see. Tell me the issues that you have. Tell me, you know, all these things. So, for instance, when you're talking about an electronic vehicle company, it's like, okay, how are you going to source the materials for your batteries? How do you think about charging stations? How do you think about competition and deployment? Where's your price point? Who's, you know, all those things and, and the challenges because obviously major motor companies are not standing idly. And so how do you position yourself? I don't hear a lot of that. Uh, I hear a lot of hoopla, but, but that's sort of a, you know, to emphasize maybe a current point about something that is, is a big issue, which is, um, what are the challenges we can think of? But of course, and, and this was uh, advice, uh, you may be familiar with John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins. So mm -hmm. 25 years ago, I'm getting started really as a venture capitalist. And, and John said, look, I've got a very simple way to think about things. When you start a company, there's 50 things that are going to go wrong. And if you're a genius, you probably thought of 20 to 25 before, and you're probably not a genius, right? So most things that go wrong are things you didn't think about. And so uh, what do you do when the unexpected happens? And, and I know we're gonna get into some you know, very specific uh, case scenarios and case studies, but, but that general point uh, I think is very powerful because when it comes to marketing, when it comes to uh, these kinds of programs for businesses, it's something that is almost an afterthought in many of the businesses I get involved with. And it ultimately becomes you know, one of the most important things that any company does. And you know, one of the things that uh, just a little history, but you know, maybe 20 years ago, we all thought kind of as computer scientists and engineers, well, if the thing works, it'll just sell, right? Mm -hmm. You know, not really, right? <laughs> and if, you know, and 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 so there was a lot of the you know, the, you know, you've heard all these stories where you know the engineering team says, okay, we've got this software, hardware, whatever done, so just go sell it, as if that just happens, right? right. And then you realize, well, you know that that we'll call it that equation that delivers revenue, that may be the most important thing for us to think about yeah. and how we're actually going to deliver a product and a service to a customer and how we, you know, when you really create value and, I'll, and we'll get into a little of this, but you know, one of the things that great companies who have really great marketing positioning, one of the things that they do is they create, you know, we call it a closed loop, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I, I, I'm attracted to your product you deliver what you promise on, which is a big deal, right? What, what do I really promise? What, what am I really delivering to this customer? But then if I like that, then I find ways to connect with my customer so I can improve that. So then he stays with me and then 
she buys more and then they come together and and I have this loop and you know you've seen it with Apple you've seen it with uh, Netflix you've seen it with these other companies where they just find a way to constantly improve their product but it really comes from positioning and if you will a promise to deliver value and then delivering on that promise and then continuing to deliver value right absolutely so, I, so wait okay, let me so, ask you you yeah. know that I'm an elevator pitch coach so Okay. I don't know who you're trying to sell to these days, but could you give us your elevator pitch to, and we'll pretend, who are you trying to sell to? Who am I supposed to pretend to be? All right, so, well, uh, you know, so since I'm, uh, you know, kind of an investor and entrepreneur involved with several businesses, am I trying to sell myself as an investor or am I trying to sell my, you know, one of my companies and what they do? I just want to be- Pick the biggest the, priority one. Pick the one that you want to get most um, traction on. Okay, so, um, you know, a fundamental disruption is occurring in the financial industry where everything can now be digitized. We have seen that previously when all content and all, all products and services can be delivered in a digital platform. What happens now when all financial transactions can be delivered on a common digital platform? This is maybe the single biggest opportunity in investments in finance for this generation. And I'm involved in a company that's involved in that very area. And what are you trying to sell? Well, I, I, we're selling we're selling a platform that allows for we'll call it digital decentralized finance, where all investors and borrowers and lenders and entrepreneurs can meet on a common platform and deal directly with each other without the need for intermediaries, without the need for yeah. you know delay and processing. And we provide a liquid, stable digital coin that mm -hmm. can then be transferable. So. The idea is venture capital is suddenly liquid and private equity is liquid and entrepreneurs can can access a global financial market now and not just the guys who can drive 40 minutes to have a meeting. And who's your target? Who who would I be? Who would you be pitching to? So I would be pitching to um, a, a combination of, of an, uh, entrepreneurs, business people, investors, okay. lenders, yep. you know, essentially looking for um, kind of, you know, anyone in any, you know, it, it, the one thing about finance, you know, the, the reason I'll just, let me just digress for a second. You know, when we had the banking bailouts in 2008, people were very upset. Well, why aren't you bailing out local businesses? Why aren't you doing those things? Because banking and finance is, is just not the same kind of business. It's an intermediary to the economy. Right. So if you don't have an intermediary, you don't have an economy, right? So that's why that has to be bailed out and why we do yeah. the things we do. So now when you have that intermediary can, can now be digitized and global and immediate and now you have you know um, a a um, not you know i'll call it non-hackable but authoritative source for you know valid contracts valid interactions valid exchanges of currency and, and value once you have that you know you now have a very disruptive platform but the idea is you know to really in my mind you know to partner with the jp morgans and the goldman sachs of the world because they are a little bit behind this. They have a legacy that they don't want to disrupt, right? Mm -hmm. So the one thing about creative destruction is people focus on the creative side of things. They forget there's destruction, right? Mm -hmm. And if you've got a big legacy infrastructure, you don't want to destroy that, right? So how can you be an augmented business mm -hmm. that can you know, enable you know, very high margin, very, very profitable transactions, but also very low cost, right? You, you can really do this for, for a de minimis marginal investment right so that's the that's the exciting thing that we see that that i think can be disruptive and when you look at uh, let's just say lending the global market for bonds is almost 200 trillion dollars with a t right and so now we see digital i'll call it decentralized finance companies they're capitalized with about you know mo no more than 10 to 15 billion dollars in total right so i i know where the curve is going Mm -hmm. And, you know, when suddenly we can have, and I'll just say this, you know, like the government of Singapore wants to issue, uh, you know, a $1 billion bond issue. They can do that digitally. And you and I can now buy those bonds where we couldn't before. I and mean, that's, right. you know, one, a very conservative example. But you and I want to start a company now. And we say, well, we have our business plan. We have our pitch. We have those things. Now, suddenly anyone can access that business plan. They can access a presentation that we record. They can access all that material and they can, you know, register and we can now sell our uh, equity uh, with a, a digitized authoritative ownership. You know, you own that like a share of stock, you know, you own it. And, you know, we now can raise capital much more efficiently and effectively. And I think that 
disintermediaries a lot of things or disintermediates, I guess is the English, right? Uh, a lot of things. And, and, and that's why, you know, that fundamental disruption to what I would say is probably the largest industry in the world um, where you have financial services that aren't available to billions of people. Yeah. You suddenly have, you know, something, you know, very exciting. Uh, yeah. So that's, that, that's why, yeah, so there we go. That's hardly, that would be a very long elevator ride and I apologize yeah. for that. <laughs> That, that would be like, we're stuck in the elevator for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so tell me, like, I'm dying to know, how do you market yourself, the things that you're selling? And what really was your biggest marketing mistake? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I think that uh, we'll start with, the, you know, the big mistakes. Yeah. Um, and so one of the, the, the biggest mistake I think that maybe everybody makes, I certainly make it, is... When you spend so much time understanding something, you suddenly believe that everyone else has that same context mm -hmm. and everyone else understands that, right? But they don't. And, you know, the fascinating thing, and I know we've all had that experience where you've presented something and you swear, this is very clear, you know, couldn't be more direct. Here are the three things I want you to remember about, you know, this company, this opportunity, this is what really matters. And then you have a discussion with, well-educated, informed people afterwards, and they have, you know, they got it completely wrong, right? Yeah. Which means you got it completely wrong. And, and so I think the first, I think the first rule is, it is the responsibility of the presenter, uh, you, know, you know, whoever it is, the lecturer, the teacher, you know, the explainer, the presenter, it is your responsibility to communicate clearly. And I can't emphasize that enough because people talk about getting the, you know, the message just right, Right? Well, unless, unless you remember my message, it doesn't matter, right? And so the biggest mistake is I spend way too much time honing a message and not enough time understanding how to communicate it clearly. And, you know, just like I think we just went through a, a, a rambling discussion from me on decentralized finance, which is something I've, you know, I mean, I even have a degree in this stuff, right? I've spent a lot of time in this area and I cannot wait to tell you everything I know, right? But you don't want to hear that, right? You know, it's like, 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 what, at the end of it, like, what is your point? What's, you know, why should I care, right? And so I think one of the, the, the mnemonics that helped me a lot is when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm finished with anything I think I want to say, I always then say to myself, okay, so what, right? And a lot of times you kind of go, yeah, so what, right? You know, so yeah. I just told you, like, you know, who cares, right? So, um, so the important thing is making sure that, that you're understood. Right. So, so be very, you know, em empathetic with your audience. Mm. And it's like, you know, you, you don't really have this context. You haven't seen all these opportunities when you ask, well, why do you, why is that a big opportunity? You know, part of me is like, wait, can't you see this? I mean, but I, you know, I mean, I've been spending, you know, a couple of years looking at it and you're spending five minutes and I'm, you're supposed to have the same understanding. Right. So that's, that's the, the single biggest mistake, I think. Yeah. I and, love that. I love that. You know, and, and I think, and I think the other thing is, uh, you know, and I can't emphasize this enough. One of the things that I underestimated was the value of a network. Mm. And, you know, and now we're seeing, you know, a virtual network. So, you know, Shala, now you and I can connect, yeah. right? So we're seeing this value, um, right? And, and, I, and, I, and it's a tool that uh, is, is, has been understated. I know Reid Hoffman ha has done, made a great presentation on this when he talked about LinkedIn and what they were trying to accomplish with that. And it's very important. And I had really underestimated the value of the network. And even, you know, schools that I went to, you know, let's say many years ago in the Stone Age, uh, that alumni network is still very powerful. And, I, and that's like anecdotal. But, you know, the network of people, and I think that there's something else about that I want to emphasize. And this is a big mistake that I made, <clears throat> which is, and pardon me while I get a little sip here. Of, it's it's yeah, still yeah, morning. So, drinking. yeah. Uh, I've been drinking, oh. so go ahead. But, you know, one of the things that Steve Jobs talked about is kind of the ability to connect some dots, right? To see some things that may or you may not think they're related, but suddenly you kind of have this way to connect them. You know, in that one of his speeches, he gave that great talk about taking calligraphy. And well, that has nothing to do with anything. Well, when you think about fonts and computers, well, it actually does, right? And so the, the thing about a network is uh, a mistake that I've also made is going very deep and, 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 and very narrow. In, in connecting with people. It's like, well, this is an area that, that I understand and I know these people and, and kind of that's that, 
right? Instead of thinking about truly broadening the experience because you get perspectives that you might not otherwise see. And it, it really is a, you know, a great thing to have somebody look at something with just truly fresh eyes, right? And so a network where you know, you're just involved in a community and people think, well, you know, why, why would I want that, right? And you get a chance to really hone your thinking and more importantly, maybe find what, what people are looking for and kind of saying, well, you know, here's, some, here's a short shortcoming I have here and here's what I'm doing here. And, and, and here's an example. So one of the things I got involved with is just, uh, you know, I mentioned to Shala before this talk that, that I also have an office in London. And in just one of the kind of chats with some people, they were talking about the, the mobile phone market in Africa and how there's a mobile banking service called M-Pasa, right? Mm -hmm. And it's revolutionizing um, Kenya because now people can connect. You know, they, they, he's, he was telling this story where he said, well, you know, these fishermen are out on their boats and they don't know which beach to go to to sell their fish because if they all go to the same beach, there's too many fish. If they don't go to the other beach, there's no fish, right? So they, they communicate now with text messages in their little boats, right? And he's saying, this has fundamentally changed this industry. And, but now that's an aha moment. And it goes back to what I was talking about, this kind of digital finance, which like, oh, suddenly, wait a minute. And, you know, and then now, now I can ex now exchange currency and accounts and information all with a tool. And I don't need a bank. I don't need an intermediary. I can do this directly. And suddenly it's aha, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, these kinds of experiences can be, big, can be very fruitful. So that's another thing I, I, I recommend is kind of the, the value of a network and it also helps you talk to audiences about your ideas because they really have no idea what you're talking about many times, right? And then you get a very you know, thoughtful, intelligent man or woman who looks at you and go, what are you talking about? <laughs> so it really does help. Um, you know, I'd say you know, we get a little bit full of ourselves. I think that's uh, you know, just to be very blunt. And uh, I think setting up a context to understand. And if I can give a good analogy, it's, it's like you know, if you show up to a foreign country you know, just think, you don't have the context to understand their culture. They don't really understand you, you know, the kind of depth. So you try to find common ground because you, you, you know immediately, well, this is a different environment. I have to think of a, how to communicate with, with you know, some kind of commonality. Right? Absolutely. So, so what parting advice do you have for our viewers and our listeners around marketing? Yeah. So I would say that the, uh, there's a couple things. One is people still really matter. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes we think in terms of an algorithm and a formula, like, okay, they, you know, and, and marketing many times becomes this whiteboard exercise where you have, well, here's my addressable market. Here's, you know, where I'm going to initially launch. And, you know, you have this formula, but you still have to deal with people, right? And you, and you really do forget that. And so the, the message, you know, and we're talking about this a lot, you know, the message that where you want to position yourself is how can I really connect with a, with a person. I mean, at the, at kind of at the end of the day, and I, I like this analogy, if you think about uh, you know, any economy, it's, you know, Shal, it's you and I exchanging a product or a service times a trillion. You know, mm -hmm. that's an economy, right? And if you don't understand that fundamentally there's still a single interaction, right? That's, that's one thing that I think is really, you know, missed um, in, in many dimensions of how we think about how to approach things, right? And of course, if you think about great marketing campaigns, you know, they really touch you with emotion, right? And, you know, the, the great kind of campaigns, you can, we can all rattle them off where you're like, you know, I, I feel something here. Well, when you're, you know, you're working with people, you know, they, you, they want to feel something. You want to be, you want to be connected, right? So that's the first thing is marketing connects people and it is people that are connected, right? And then the second thing, which we, we touched on is understand the context that your audience has to understand what you're trying to convey, not what you understand, right? Mm -hmm. So here's something, what do you, what, what do I want you to understand? How can I enable you to understand that? How can I give you a context? And, you know, by the way, I, I, I'll, I'll use this analogy. You know, great writers tend to be great marketers. And, and here's what I mean. So if you read great novels, they tell you right away the context within which to understand this story. So you read Moby Dick, the opening line, you know, call me Ishmael. Okay, Ishmael is the key character. You have to understand that context. And that enables you to understand that story. And, you know, A Christmas Carol, right? You know, Marley is dead. You know, so there's going to be ghosts. There's going to be a story here. You have to understand that. So they set you up right away with a context to understand the complexity of their story. And 
this is what happens um, with, with great marketing. You, I set you up with a context right away to understand what I'm trying to convey to you. And then the pieces can fall into place and you can follow that narrative much more easily, you know, versus I know a lot here, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, believe me, you're going to want this here. <laughs> you know, I've thought about that. Shalo, this is just for you, right? Like, really, yeah. why? I right. love that advice. That is great advice. So how would people reach you? Um, okay. Uh, so I have, um, I do have a website uh, for, you know, my, my investment company, which is Arcadia Capital Group. And there's, um, so Arcadia Capital Group is the website. And there's my contact information there. And, uh, you know, kind of a little description about my firm and, and some research and articles and things that I write. And, uh, you know, I kind of focus some of the things I've just talked about today, I've written some articles and done some research on that. So that's wonderful. That's Thank you so much for being a guest. Well, Charlotte, this was a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Very Thank nice you. to meet you. Thank you.